The Reynolds Aluminum Program with Fibber McGee and Molly. The Reynolds Metals Company, makers of Reynolds Aluminum, presents Fibber McGee and Molly, transcribed. The show is written by Phil Leslie and Keith Fowler and directed by Max Hutto, with music by the King's Band and Billy Mills Orchestra. A common friendly question these days is, how's your garden doing? Well, we hope it's doing great. There's nothing like fresh from the garden salad greens and vegetables. But if you pick too much or pick it too soon, be sure you keep that right from the garden freshness in Reynolds Wrap, the pure aluminum foil. For loose garden produce like leaf lettuce, make an envelope of Reynolds Wrap. Lay one square on top of another, double fold and press tight around three sides. Slide your crisp, dewy, fresh greens in the open end. Then fold over that end. They'll stay fresh for days in your refrigerator. For young carrots, beets, and so forth, just wrap them in bunches. Remember, it's the loss of moisture that makes vegetables wilt. Reynolds Wrap is absolutely moisture-proof. Stock up tomorrow. Standard 25-foot rolls, 75-foot jumbo economy rolls, also heavy-duty Reynolds Wrap, half a yard wide. Get the original and genuine, made by the world's largest producer of aluminum foil, the Reynolds Metals Company. A sigh can be a very expressive sound. There's the happy sigh of the lover... The contented sigh of the tired man as he goes to bed. But for sheer bliss, nothing can touch this one. <sighs> That's the sigh given after breakfast by the man of the house as we join Fibber McGee and Molly. Ah, that was a great breakfast, Molly. Glad you enjoyed it, dearie. I've been eating your fried eggs every morning for 25 years, and I still like them better than anybody's. Why is that, kiddo? What's your secret? Well, it's the way I cook them. How do you cook them? Six at a time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, that's the secret. If there's anything I like, it's six eggs. I'll answer it, McGee. Don't get up. <laughs> I ain't even trying to. <laughs> McGee residence, Molly McGee speaking. Who? Oh. Why, Al Bennington, I haven't heard from you in years. Al Bennington? You're just in town for the day. Al Bennington? Oh, I'd love to see you. Yes, I can join you for lunch. Rich Vista Hotel? One o'clock. I'll be there. Oh, it'll be wonderful to see you again. Goodbye, Al. Who's Al? <laughs> An old school chum of mine. Didn't I ever mention Al Bennington to you? No, he never did. Must have been a big item in your life. <laughs> From the way you were practically crooning over the phone there. <laughs> well, I always was fond of Al. Mm. <laughs> it's been years since we've seen each other, and... Something wrong, dearie? Nope. You, uh... Would you like me to fry some more eggs? <laughs> nope. Well, what's the matter? Nothing's the matter. My gosh, just because my wife gets a phone call from somebody I never heard of that she was very fond of in school and snaps at a lunch date like a bullfrog snapping at a water bug, why should anything be the matter? <laughs> wow. Do you, uh, do you mind me going downtown for lunch? I mean, I could have Al out here well, if you... Why should I mind? You could have lunch with the entire Elks Club Drum and Bugle Corps in full uniform. <laughs> I wouldn't raise the shortest hair in either eyebrow. <laughs> Al Bennington is of no interest to me whatsoever. What's he do, a retired bootlegger? Of course not. Al is a very successful author. Writes romantic novels. Ah, romantic. The junk they write nowadays. Give me the real fine old classics like Tom Swift and his plastic cheeseburger. <laughs> or the five little peppers and how they swipe the doggy out of the window. Novels are very popular. I don't care about Al's cheap novels or about Al. I just assume we didn't even mention Al again. 
What's Al look like? <laughs> How about your height? Slimmer, though. Always did have a nice figure. And pray tell what's wrong with my figure. Nothing, dearie, nothing at all. Maybe I ain't built like a Greek statue. Maybe I have put on a few pounds around the middle. But I put them on in the American way with a knife and fork in my own home. <laughs> Not taking other guys' wives to lunch in swank hotels. <laughs> McGee, you sound just like a jealous husband. Uh, Believe me, you have no cause to be jealous of Al Bennington. Why, Al and I... Who's jealous? My gosh, I just don't like people comparing the way my structure is constructed to the way other people's structures are... Wait, dearie, come in. Oh, good morning, Dr. Gamble. Good morning, my dear. And a nod in your direction, vacuum top. <laughs> Hi, Bulgernon. Bulgernon, what's that? Well, if that's what your name ought to be. Guys named Algernon are called Algy. And if there ever was a guy that ought to be called Bulgy, you're the one. <laughs> Let him dribble, Molly. Huh? I find it quite amusing to be called Bulgy by someone who's beginning to resemble a basketball wrapped for mailing. I think we'd better change the subject. Himself is a little sensitive about his figure today. Oh, I feel better now that Fatso's here. Besides, I could lose weight if I wanted to. I'm sure the doctor could, too. As a matter of fact, I tried it at one time, Molly. Yeah? For a very good reason. I met a girl, and Cupid shot an arrow into my heart. Oh. oh what you mean, arrow? <laughs> Kid must have used a harpoon to get through all that love. <laughs> you mean your girl wanted you to lose weight, Doctor? No, it was just my own pride, Molly. She was crazy about me. Thought I was <laughs> Casanova, Don Juan, and Romeo, all rolled into one. Only trouble was I looked like it. <laughs> What'd you do, Doc? Go on a diet? Yeah, and it was murder. Yeah? For two weeks, I lived on nothing but turnip tops, skimmed carrot juice, and wheat germ with the wheat removed. <laughs> Lose much? No, I gained five pounds. You gained? How in the world could that happen? Frankly, Molly, I was baffled. My only clue was that I always went to bed starved, but got up in the morning feeling great. Hey, I bet you I know what happened. I bet you walked in your sleep. That's the conclusion I reached when I awoke one night with the roast turkey in my hand and the tail of my nightshirt caught in the icebox door. <laughs> yeah, well, was that the end of your dieting, it Doctor? It was indeed. I told my girl that she could take all of me. So we set the date and headed for the church. Hey, but you've always been a bachelor, Doc. What happened? What happened? My pride again. Oh? There wasn't room enough for her to walk down the aisle beside me, and I was too proud to carry her on my back. <laughs> so long, kid. So long, <laughs> Billy Mills in the orchestra and Big Mamu. Get ready for my luncheon date. Now you hop to it, kiddo. Better hurry up. You might be late. You only got two and a half hours. <laughs> well, I do want to look my best when I'm going to lunch at the Ritz Vista, you know. Oh, sure. Big deal. Poof. <laughs> oh, dear. I wish you wouldn't get all upset, McGee, just because... My dear, if you think I'm upset just because you're going to lunch with your old, dear old school chum that I hope you eat $27 worth on, 
<laughs> You're sadly mistaken. I don't even remember what his name is. Whose name? Al Bennington. <laughs> You see, you do remember. You're jealous. Not me, baby. If anybody ought to be jealous of old school chums, you ought to be. I had a few in my day. Really? Betcha. Like Virginia Holly that sat in front of me in history class. We was always exchanging notes during the history quizzes. Love notes? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd write, I think you're cute. Who discovered the Pacific Ocean? <laughs> and she'd write back, you're cute too, Daniel Boone. <laughs> Virginia must have been a doll. Yeah, she was just one among many. Every girl in that class wanted to get their hands on me. You don't say. Yep. They voted me the boy they'd most like to take the Vaseline out of his hair. <laughs> yeah, I had a cowlick in them days, and I put gobs. I'm that. sure you were the idol of the opposite sex, dearie, but I really must get dressed now. I'll be down soon. Okay. Ah, oh, there goes a good kid. Thinks I'm jealous of her old school chum. And she's so right. <laughs> hi, George, I ain't gonna let her know how much I'm... Hello, pal. Oh, hi, Junior. Hey, what's the matter with you, pal? You sound a little gloomy. Oh, some guy named Al that Molly used to go to school with called her, and she's gonna have lunch with him down at the sump room at the Woods Vista. Well, that's perfectly harmless, pal. Gee whiz, you don't have to worry about Molly. You're not jealous, are you? You said it, I'm jealous. Doggone it, i never been up against anything like this before, Hilo. I don't know what to do. Should I run away from home? Or should I just... Leave her a note and go throw myself in the fairgrounds lagoon. <laughs> the shallow end, of course, among the lily pads. <laughs> well, I know what I'd do if I were you. I'd give her the old romantic treatment. Romantic treatment? Mm-hmm. Pitch a little woo at her, boy. Be so attentive and affectionate to her that she'll never give a thought to anybody else again. Get gooey, huh? Right. <laughs> Look, go out to Dugan's Lake tonight. Take Molly out in a boat. An aluminum boat. <laughs> Aluminum boat? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One of those beautiful lifetime aluminum boats made of Reynolds aluminum. Just drift around the lake in it while you whisper sweet nothings in her ear. Wouldn't the sweet nothings mean nothing in a wooden boat? <laughs> Pal, this is the woman you love. For her, the best. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Aluminum. A lifetime aluminum <laughs> boat with the hull stamped out in one solid piece. That's the thing to take her out in, pal. Rust-proof, seamless, leak-proof, everlasting aluminum. I is it okay if I take my mandolin along? It's wood, but <laughs> it sounds like aluminum. <laughs> sure, sure. Take it along. Ah, that's the sort of thing women go for. Yeah. Music, moonlight, and a handsome aluminum boat. Ah. Yeah, you get them out on a moonlit lake, and they're mighty easy to handle. The women? No, the boats. Oh. <laughs> Boy, how the women love those aluminum boats. Yeah. They're strong and sturdy, but they're light as a feather. Without a bit of effort, you can hold them in your arms. The boats? No, the women. Oh. <laughs> Makes them feel romantic, drifting around the lake in a bright, modern, lifetime aluminum boat. And boy, how they can travel. When you take a paddle to them, pal, they go. The women? No, the boat. Oh. <laughs> That's why I say take Molly out in an aluminum boat, which needs no care. Because the women we love deserve the best we can give them. Uh -huh. Ah, what would we do without them, pal? They're mankind's greatest gift. The boats? Yes. Oh. <laughs> and they're really wonderful with outboard motors, you know. If you take a lifetime aluminum boat and an outboard motor on your vacation, pal, you'll really love it. Because hey, hey, believe... look, look, Junior, I'm not going on a vacation. I'm making Molly forget a guy named Al, remember? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Worked so good, I forgot him myself. Yeah. Well... Anyhow, that's how I'd handle this thing. Yeah? Yeah. The average man can make a woman think he's the handsomest, most charming guy that ever lived if he gives her the treatment I suggested. Just an aluminum boat and a mandolin will do it, huh? Well, in your case, it might take a steam yacht and a pipe organ. <laughs> so long, pal. Maybe giving Molly the romantic treatment ain't such a bad idea at that. Maybe if I'm real charming, she won't even go to lunch with that character. Boy, I'll be so dad ratted galant, she won't know what I'm doing when I start... Hey, Mickey, to... I need your help. This dress button's down the back and I can't reach it. Don't move. Huh? Don't move. I always want to remember you just the way you are. <laughs> Standing there with your eyes flashing, your ruby lips gleaming, and your dress unbuttoned down the back. <laughs> Heavenly days, what's this all about? Oh, just a small tribute of my esteem to a lady I'll always be esteemed up about. Oh, well, thank you. I'm deeply grateful. Deeply flabbergasted, too. You know I've always been yours to command, my dear. 
Would you like me to yank a fistful of stars out of the sky or chuck some rose petals around for you to trample on or perchance skin a grizzly bear and bring you its hide fresh with dew? <laughs> Name the task, Tootsie, and I'm your boy. I've already named it. Button me down the back. <laughs> Seems kind of tame, but okay. <laughs> Don't leave us let this moment die, kiddo. Leave us let it last forever. You here beside me, and me here beside you, with nobody besides us beside us. <laughs> I'll spend the day whispering sweet nothings into one ear and singing I'm a ding-dong daddy from Dumas into the other. Well, it sounds wonderful, dearie, but some other time. I've got to keep my lunch date now with Al Bennington. Am I buttoned? Yeah, you're buttoned. Thank you. Look, McGee, why don't you come along and have lunch with us? You'd like Al and Oh, I'm no, sure no, no, you... no, sir. It's very kind of you to invite an outsider to your touching little reunion, my dear, but no thanks. This little piggy stays home. Well, I've got to go finish uh, putting on my makeup. If you change your mind, let me know. Mm. I stand here pouring my heart out to her, buttoning her up like a Parker House roll. <laughs> Hoping she'll call off her date and what happens. Come along with us, she says. You'd like Al, she says. Boiled in a barrel of crankcase drainings, I'd like Al. <laughs> George, if I ever said I'd... Come in. Oh, hi, Ole. Well, hello, McGee. You by yourself? Where, where's your missus? No, she's upstairs, Ole. Getting dolled up to go meet some guy she used to go to school with. He's taking her to lunch at the Ritz Vista. And doggone it, I'm worried. Right. They have very good food at the Ritz Vista. <laughs> Not the food, Ole. I'm worried because she's going out with another guy. Oh, that's silly, McGee. She wouldn't care about another fellow when she's got a husband like you. You sure? Well, sure, I'm sure. You just look at a good-looking fellow. You... Well, you just look how much money... Well, just look with a fine physique. <laughs> and no wonder you're worried. There's <laughs> nothing to make jokes about, Ollie. Well, who's making jokes? Well, gee whiz, you never had this kind of trouble at your house. I'll bet all the years you've been married, your wife never even looked at another guy. <laughs> that shows what you know. Yeah? One time my missus had a terrible case on a fella. Uh-oh. Went to see him every day while I was at work. No kidding. Spent my hard-earned money on him, too. My gosh, what'd you do about it? I knocked off ten cents a day from her allowance. <laughs> Ten cents. Missus, I say, I won't stop you from seeing Clark Gable every day, but by golly, you cut out the popcorn. <laughs> well, that ain't exactly the same kind of a... I'm already... Oh, hello, Ollie. Hello, missus. My ain't we dressed up today. Yes, I have a luncheon date. McGee, I'm going to the beauty shop for a hairdo first, and from there to the hotel. Our date is uh, one o'clock, so why don't you meet me in the lobby and have lunch with us? I'd like Al... Oh, no, 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 not me. I'll just sit here in this empty house... And wait. Alone. Well, I've got a rush, McGee. I'll miss you, dearie. Yeah. You missed him that time, too, missus. You better took another run at it. <laughs> well, she went. Yeah. Quick, watch her out the window, Ollie. Where should I want you? Go on. It's a nice dress she's got on that's buttoned crooked in the back, but when you see one dress buttoned crooked, you've seen them all, oh. McGee. <laughs> Let me know when she's out of sight. As soon as she's gone, I'm going to beat it down to the hotel ahead of her. I'll hide around the lobby and see what this Al Bennington guy looks like. Oh, I wouldn't care if he looks like Clark Gable, McGee. You, you shouldn't do that. What do you mean? She's your own missus, McGee. You just got to trust her, that's all. Huh? Any fella that don't trust his mistress don't deserve to have one. Yeah, but gee, where's all Besides, the... Besides, I, I can't go with you anyhow. Oh. I gotta go home and fix the screen in the living room. Fix the screen? Is it busted? No, but it will be. What you mean? My missus tells me they got a Clark Gable picture on the television tonight. That's the screen I'm going to fix. <laughs> I'd kick the living daylights out of the thing. Well, I'd bust it in 90 million... Now, wait a minute. The King's Men and me and Marie. You ought to see little me and Marie by the old seaside. By the ocean we set and we pet and we pet till we get swept off by the tide. You may have been to Corny and kept both of your eyes open wide, but you ought to see me and Marie by the old seaside. You ought to see little me and Marie by the old seaside. By the ocean we send and we pet and we pet till we get swept out by the tide. You may have been to Coney and kept both of your eyes open wide, but you ought to see me and Marie by the old seaside. Only me and my Marie together. It's beautiful beside the sea. 
together We love to linger in the breezy weather As long as we can always be together If you want to see a thing of beauty You should see me spooning with my little cutie By the old seaside For when once we get the proper setting We begin a petting and go on a petting Till we end up getting such an awful weapon from the tide First we talk about that and this a bit Then we walk about and hug and kiss a bit Till we finally find a spot where we can hide Then until the crowing of the chickens Me and my Marie proceed to raise the dickens By the old Sure is packed today. If I could stay here behind these potted palms, I can spot Molly and that Al Bennington when they come in the front door. I just want to see what kind of a guy my wife. Hello, Mr. McGee. Oh. <laughs> oh, hello, Wimp. I knew it was your head peeping through the palm leaves. Oh. I was with Mr. Frobisher, mm -hmm. and he said it was a coconut, but I said, no, that's Mr. McGee. <laughs> yeah, that's me. I, I just come in to cool off. <laughs> Boy, I'm hot. What are you doing here? I've been attending the regular monthly luncheon of the Wistful Vista Bird Watchers. Oh? Oh, we had a dandy today. <laughs> Something special, huh? Yes. The hotel chef prepared a lovely menu for us. Oh? On each plate was a mound of spinach arranged in the shape of a bird's nest. Oh. Inside the nest were tiny boiled potatoes egg size, and on the edge of the nest was a large meatball carved in the shape of a bobolink, holding in its beak a piece of spaghetti in the shape of a worm. Boy, he sure got into the spirit of it. Now we're all going to Walt's Malt Shop for a hamburger. On top of all that food? Oh, it was so cute, we didn't have the heart to eat it. <laughs> we just let it sit there while we had the songs and speeches. Songs and speeches, huh? Yes. We opened with our bird watchers anthem. Oh. <clears throat> Off we go into the wild woods yonder, watching birds little and big. <laughs> we may see a lavender sapsucker or the blue thingamajig. <laughs> Boy, that song ought to go places, Wimp. <laughs> Maybe you ought to go with it. <laughs> I knew you'd like it. <laughs> After the anthem, Mr. Frobisher delivered an address on buzzards. Do they really fly high down in Mobile? <laughs> this was followed by a humorous reading from Mrs. Clatterhatch oh. entitled, Who Put the Oriole in Mrs. Murphy's Camisole? <laughs> Boy, you really lived it up today. <laughs> then... <clears throat> I spoke. Oh, you spoke. My talk was on the habits of the northern South Dakota bent beak. <laughs> the bent beak? Yes. Uh -huh. The bent beak is a bird with remarkably keen hearing. Oh? It can hear worms crawling deep in the ground, even under a concrete sidewalk. No fool. When it hears a worm under a concrete sidewalk, it doesn't stop to consider, but just hauls off and pecks away. Wow. Hence the name, bent beak. <laughs> Well, I must join the other bird watchers, Mr. McGee. Goodbye. Yeah, so long, Walter. Glad he left before Molly and Al Bennington got here. I've been keeping an eye on the front door, and I know they haven't... Hello, been... dear. Oh, my gosh. Hey, how'd you get in here? To the side door while you were watching the front. Well, what you mean, watching? I haven't been watching. I just, well, I came in... I the... had a hunch I'd find you here in the lobby. Yeah, but, Molly, I just haven't... Sure to... enough, there you were, crouched behind a potted palm like a stag at bay. Well, doggone it, Molly. A guy's got a right to see who his wife's having lunch with. You said this Al Bennington was a writer, and some of them writers can't be trusted. They live in attics and grow beards and spot poetry that ain't got rhymes on the end. <laughs> Maybe this owl's a bad egg. Well, we'll just settle that right now. Come on, now. You're going to meet Al and have lunch with Oh, him. no, no, sir. You think I want people to think I don't trust you? Come on. I ain't the type to prize into your business. You go have your lunch. I'll look at him through the window. Now, quit pulling me. Al? No. Oh, Al, here I am. No. Over here. No, let go of my arm, Molly. I'm going home. I'm not going to... Al, it's so nice to see you, and I want you to meet my husband. Well, how do you do, Mr. McGee? I've heard so much about you. <laughs> this is her. Yeah, but... Alice Bennington, my favorite author. Her friends call her Al. 
Hi, Al. <laughs> well, you seem a little surprised, Mr. McGee. Don't I look the way you thought I'd look? Well, frankly, Al, uh, no. <laughs> But, gee, Al, you, you sure look fine to me, Al. <laughs> yeah. Now will you join us for lunch, dearie? Join you? I'll pick up the check, kiddo. Hey, Garcon, the best table in the house. Too sweet. Ah, this will be a delightful literary treat. You wrote any good books lately, Al? I loved your last one. About the Congress. <laughs> Fibber and Molly will be back in a moment. This year, the Ford Motor Company is celebrating its 50th anniversary. The Reynolds Metals Company salutes Ford on this full half-century of automotive progress, a half-century that almost coincides with the practical development of aluminum. Ford's early Model Ts and Model As had none of the modern metal in them. Today's brilliant new Fords use aluminum in many vital parts, for strength with lighter weight, for rust-proof permanence, for economy and safety. An even more striking demonstration of aluminum is Ford's experimental car, the Continental X, on which Reynolds engineers have worked closely with Ford engineers in developing many new aluminum features. The Continental X contains more than 400 individual aluminum parts compared to 20 or 30 in the average car on the road today. That's Reynolds Aluminum, made by the Reynolds Metals Company, pioneers of progress through aluminum. It was a wonderful lunch, wasn't it? Yeah. How'd you like my friend Al Bennington? <laughs> Aren't you ashamed for acting so jealous? Kiddo, I sure learned my lesson today. So help me, I'll never do a thing like that again as long as I live. Act like a jealous husband, you mean? Oh, no. Offer to pick up the check for a stranger. <laughs> that old school chum of yours eats like a horse. <laughs> oh, Mickey. Good night. Good night, Al. <laughs> Metals Company, Pioneers of Progress Through Aluminum, has brought you Fibber McGee and Molly, transcribed with Bill Thompson, Arthur Q. Bryan, Dick Legrand, Paula Winslow, and me, Harlow Wilcox. By the way, next Sunday is Father's Day. This is the one day in the year the American family pays tribute to the man who devotes the rest of the year to them. Don't forget to show him that he is appreciated. Sunday night is also the time to see Mr. Peepers, starring Wally Cox on NBC television. And be sure to be with us again next Tuesday night. Good night. It's June and vacation time across the nation. And to millions of Americans, vacation time means a trip in the family car. When you drive to and from your vacation this summer, be sure to observe the speed laws. Remember, driving is a full-time job. Take your tip from the professional truck driver and keep alert. For at high speeds, you can get into trouble fast through inattention to the road ahead. Slow down at sundown and always drive according to the prevailing road conditions. The life you save may be your own. Tonight, play Two for the Money with Herb Schreiner on NBC.